Well, hello and welcome to Malaysia. And I hope that you're going to stay with me for the next 55 minutes. It's a live program. It's interaction, which means we'd love to hear from you. Um, that means emails and texts. If you want to write in and talk to us about some of the issues we want to talk about tonight, then that's the number, that's the uh, address on the screen. We'd love to hear from you. In a few minutes' time, we're going to talk to a couple. If I say to you words like childhood abuse, racial bullying, proof school, armed robbery, prison, but a remarkable encounter with God that changed lives, you'll get some idea where we're going to go. I'm going to be talking to a couple called Lennox and uh, Bally, and uh, they're going to be sharing their story with us, um, a story which rings with so many people in our society today. And I suspect that as they begin to unpack their story, it may well spill over and you've got questions to ask about the whole racial situation at this moment of time, uh, what's happening with the Black Lives Matter and slaves, and who knows where it's going to go. So we're open for up those questions tonight and uh, we'd be delighted to hear from you. So get your emails and your texts ready to send them in. But first of all, those of you who are astute and clever will recognize that I'm no Howard Conder, who's normally sitting in this chair on a Monday night. So where is Howard? Why don't I allow him simply to tell you? Over to you, Howard. Just to let you know that after a week of being resting from live shows, you know, Leslie and I have just started to relax and also to catch up on some of the things that we've neglected over the weeks, months, and in my case, years. Therefore, we think it wise uh, for our physical and mental well-being, for us to, at least, not to resume live shows until after the summer. You know, we're not getting any younger. 17 years non-stop has taken its toll. I am, however, learning new software to increase my creative skills, which hopefully will bear fruit in future Revelation TV shows. So, uh, meanwhile, I'm enjoying my music. And Leslie, of course, is organising guests and presenters uh, so that your favourite programmes can continue. I've had a reassuring email from the Charity Commission, uh, which seems uh, to bring an end to this nightmare investigation uh, very soon. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to look forward to the future with a lot more confidence and a spring in my step, as it were, and uh, with joy in my heart, which is what has been so missing, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And special thanks again to those who faithfully continued to support us during all of this time, including the lockdown. And I uh, just want to say that uh, we took the decision not to do the sort of marathon type style uh, fundraising programs. Uh, it's not really our style, so, and yet you've seen through uh, that and, and continue to support us really, really is encouraging. Thank you. And so with all that support, we're able to continue and we're looking forward, really looking forward to using the new studios and uh, where we can produce some really great programming for you. And uh, it's going to give us a new lease of life, as it were. And uh, thank you just uh, for all your prayers and concerns uh, for us through these difficult times. And uh, just say, God bless you all. is the time for revelation. So, no Howard tonight, uh, but it's not actually that they're just enjoying a lovely holiday. Uh, they're continuing to do lots of different works in the background, so um, you'll be hearing from them, I'm sure, on some of the programmes. But I'm pleased to say I'm not alone in the studio uh, tonight. I'd like to introduce you to Ellie Hudson. 
Ellie, Hello, good Gordon. to have you with thank, me. Thank you for having me. It's great. And if Ellie is a face that you're not familiar with, it's because normally you're the other side of the wall, <laughs> aren't you? I am. I'm a producer, a director, an editor, um, Gordon's technical help, I'm, and a presenter as well on my programme Reflections. Yeah, but, but I mean, if I just say to you that the last few weeks during lockdown, while we've been doing our mornings from here, uh, I mean, every morning around about 8.30, you're in the, <laughs> the office getting the whole programme together, aren't I you? I am, yeah. I actually love it, though. I think when lockdown all started, we, we thought to ourselves, OK, maybe it's going to be a month. Um, I mean, never did I think it would be this long and we'd still be here. Um, but it's just been fantastic. I mean, we've had our um, such busy days and we've been in the office and the studios for crazy amounts of time, but it's all massively been worth it. Well, we appreciate it and it's good to have you tonight. So first time on a live programme. It is indeed. <laughs> yeah. So there's no nerves tonight, is no, there? No, not at all. <laughs> no. And if you send an email in, then it's going to come to Ellie, who's got the iPad, and uh, she'll be telling me another email in, Gordon. So will be. she'll be reading them out <laughs> as they come in. So that's who you're writing to tonight when you write into Revelation TV. But, but Ellie, folks may have seen you because you do uh, present a programme on Revelation, don't you? I do. It's called Reflections because when I was thinking about my program I knew I wanted to do it on videos and I was thinking what can I call this program because what we do in it is we look at testimonies we look at songs we look at times of worship we look at also um, spoken words from major different people who are on the internet and also um, we look at Charles Stanley um, Bishop T.D. Jakes a lot of the renowned Bible teachers out there and it's really a time to reflect and it's based on a variety of different topics but they really do affect so many people out there so it's it's a good time to be able to reflect in my program okay and if people want to watch reflections when's it on it is on at Saturdays at 10 p.m. I'm not sure when the repeat is okay but I was just testing you there to see if you knew when your program was on. Yes. OK, and, and it's also available, of course, online Absolutely. for people to watch it. We're just going to look at a little piece so that viewers can get an idea of your kind of presenting style. What are we going to look at? We're going to have a look at a testimony because we are going to be looking at a testimony today. And what's so great about them is you don't know who's watching them. It could be somebody who's just flipped on our channel and it can really affect their life and change it for the better. So we're going to be looking at Justin Bieber's testimony because what I wanted to do is really attract the younger people who perhaps look at him as an idol um, and that they would see that he's actually taken God into his life and really turned it for the better. OK, well, we haven't got time to watch all of it, no. but here's just a taster of Reflections presented by Ellie Hudson. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Reflections and you're with me Ellie Hudson the host and producer of this show and today I wanted to bring to you a topic which is quite close to my heart as well because of being young and because of being a Christian and it's basically just talking about what it's like being a Christian and I found some excellent videos from celebrities such as Justin Bieber and Kanye West who are talking about their faith and they're really promoting their faith and the Christian network and really encouraging younger people to do the same so I wanted to start off with a scripture which is mark 16 15 and it says and he said to them go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature I think this is so important because that's what we're meant to be doing as Christians is preaching the gospel sharing the word and really encouraging everybody to do the same so my first video I want to go to is about Justin Bieber and he's talking about his faith. He's talking about how he, what it's like being a Christian for him. And I think it's really going to connect with a lot of young people. Um, so here we, here we have Justin Bieber. I just didn't know what the heck was going on. And so I really took a deep dive in my faith, to be honest. I just went deep into, like, I believed in Jesus, but I never really, like, you know, when it says following Jesus is actually turning away from sin. Mm. And so there's no, what, what it talks about in the Bible, it's like there's no obedience. There's no faith without obedience. So it's like I had had faith about like, oh, I believe Jesus died on the cross for me, but I never really implemented it mm. into my life. I never like was like, I'm going to be obedient. So when did you decide to actually move within the guidelines and how did you find yourself away from, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to drink or do drugs or sleep around or all these other distractions. How did you get out of that world? What was the turning point for you? 
I think it was my perception of who Jesus really was, you know? Um, I'd had really bad examples of Christians in my life uh, who would say one thing and do another. So they were the, my direct example of who Jesus was. That's why you didn't take it seriously. I didn't take it as seriously because I didn't have good examples. Good role models. They, yeah. The way I look at my relationship with God and with Jesus is I'm not trying to earn God's love by... Well, that's just a taster of reflections. 10 o'clock on a Saturday, if you want to watch um, Ellie and listen to a program. And you've got about, what, 10, 12 programs that yes. you've done already? Yeah, I believe so. And if you log on to Revelation TV's website, you can also watch all of them there on our catch-up service. OK. And from next Saturday, you're starting presenting uh, Best Bits for us, aren't you? Yes, that's right. So I'll have all the Best Bits for the week um, on that program. OK, well, we're looking forward to that very much. And uh, so it'll be Saturday night with Ellie. It will. Rather, <laughs> it will. So uh, in a moment, we're going to be speaking to Lennox and to Bally Rogers. And uh, they're going to be sharing something of a story. It's such a difficult story that they've got to share of gangs and, and rape and all sorts of things that happened in their life and the way that they've turned it around and helping so many other people. Uh, and if you've got any emails, we're looking forward to receiving them. Have we got any emails? Um, we haven't yet. We've got one that um, is from Dave, which men mentions you bouncing up and down on the trampoline. I believe Dave must have seen the video from I this think that morning. was cut out. <laughs> <laughs> it was indeed. Um, and he said, Howard will have you climbing up the Eiffel Tower next. Is that right? No, no, no. <laughs> OK, just this morning on um, our mornings, they showed a piece of Howard and I in a trampoline. But I think we decided for the respectable late show it wasn't suitable to show. But I'm pleased to say that Lennox and Bally are on the line to us now. So good evening and welcome to the programme. Thank you so much for talking to us. Hi. Hi. <laughs> OK, so, so, so just tell us a little bit. Where are you ringing us from? Where are you speaking to us from? We're in um, Kent. Green Hive in Kent. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. And, and, and Bally, there's, there's a new book out, isn't there? Can you just tell us a little bit about the book? Okay. Um, so, hello, everybody, and thank you very much for having us on the show. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I just uh, just speak briefly about the book. The book was um, uh, was donated, the money for the book was donated by um, a very kind gentleman who heard Lennox on. LBC talking about um, issues of the heart around gangs and kind of grassroots stuff that goes on that Lily put into this kind of stuff and uh, um, he emailed us and said I'd love to help you write your book and uh, it's amazing that uh, we had the opportunity to be able to put it into a book that is for the marketplace really it's for people who haven't encountered Jesus haven't had an encounter that's turned their lives totally around to um, to him Fully. And, uh, you know, it, it's almost um, a story of a prodigal, really. And, um, you know, in as I said, in the marketplace, but also, you know, Christians are very, very welcome to read it. And it's a great encouragement that nothing is impossible for God. Amen. Well, we, 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 you didn't <laughs> ask us to promote the book, but we just wanted to do that. If there are folks who are listening, oh, who hear your story you. and uh, want to know how to get hold of a copy of it, how do they do that? Well, they can go onto the website, break, uh, breakingbetter.co.uk, and there's three different options. There's a Kindle, there's an Amazon, and you can get a signed copy. Wow. If you want to, uh, <laughs> directly from us. <laughs> OK. So there's three choices. Well, Lennox, you've got a remarkable story, and uh, the things that have happened in your life uh, are traumatic, and I want you to share them with us in a moment. But you've prepared just a short video, and we want to just show that. Um, it's just you talking about the change and the effect that it's had. And then when we come back, you're going to share your story with us. OK. My name is Lennox Rogers. I am a mentor and a coach. I am an author and I'm a, an ex-offender. My early life in Oxford was very difficult. My parents, they were quite religious. They used to force me to go to church and I used to run away. I was very strongly disciplined with the belt, sometimes the buckle of the belt. It was very hard. I was sexually abused by my godfather from probably the age of six or seven and then at the age of 
12, um, I was raped. Much like today in parts of London, there were gangs everywhere. Some of them had racist views. I got beaten up a lot. I had to plan my route to get from my house to school sometimes or to the shops. I started stealing. By the time I was 11, I'd been to court five times. My mother was so fed up with me. She said, I don't want you anymore. Eventually, the court decided to put me into care, but it was difficult. My first night in care, I cried myself to sleep. And in the end, they were going to send me to prison, but decided to give me a chance in an approved school. Leaving school, I tried to rebuild my life. I used to go to this pub, it was called the Labour Exchange. It was called the Labour Exchange by criminals. There was a guy who got me involved with an organised crime gang because I'd got a reputation for violence, fighting, used me as an enforcer. I'd done a string of armed robberies for them. My violence came to the attention of their police and uh, I was put in prison. I was, I was broken. I, I, I didn't know what to do and I just wanted to change. My life now is um, amazingly different. When I came out of prison, I was given an opportunity to make a change. This young family took me in and we lived in this big house, me and, and other ex-prisoners. Just a husband and wife with a, a three-year-old daughter at the time. Whilst I was at this family's home, some youth workers from the local area asked me to talk to a 40-strong gang. They sat and listened to me for two hours, but they were so impacted by what I shared with them that they decided they didn't want to be involved in a gang. It's an amazing opportunity to be able to use my lived experience to put something back. This young family, they took me to church with them one day, which is where I met my wife, Bally. We got together and set up the charity Refocus. I always say that Refocus is a link in the chain. We work with other services and we acknowledge that to help change someone, it takes everybody. We work with young people doing mentoring, coaching, and for me, it's my way of saying sorry. My life uh, is just amazing, more than I can ever have imagined. I'm married, I'm an author, a mentor, a coach. You, you know, I never thought, because of all the things that happened to me, I thought that was going to be me, but I'm more than my past. It's not about how you start, it's about how you finish. I'm a completely different guy. For sharing some of your story there, and in a few moments we're, we're going to talk about the change that came in your life and what caused it but let me start by just saying can you just share with us a bit more of your your past and some of the things that you went through you just hinted at them there in that uh, video that we watched yeah um i grew up in the 60s and 70s and it was very racist in the oxford town that i was in and uh, it, you still had some signs on the windows that said no blacks, uh, no Irish, no Indians, no Chinese, no dogs. You still saw some of those. And um, I grew up around gangs. Um, I went to a school and people um, were horrible to you. They called you names and some... Um, kid would stand in the middle of the playground and shout blacks against whites and then all the um, uh, English white children would be one end of the playground and there was about seven or eight of us from ethnic backgrounds we would um, stand there and they would attack us the only people that fought on our side were uh, the Scottish and the Irish kids 
Um, I think they probably just wanted an excuse to fight the English. Uh, <laughs> but um, they, um, they fought on our side and teachers would watch from the classroom windows, um, you know, and perhaps placing bets. And we got this every day um, from about 8.30 to 9 when the school bell rang. And throughout the day, we got abuse and gangs would wait for us after school to beat us up. So, um, you know, and I rebelled at parents. They used to beat me. They never taught racism. They um, were more concerned in how I reacted, um, you know, when I had any problems. And um, they just saw me as perhaps the one who was, um, you know, making all the trouble. And so it was very difficult. I got help with racism from my neighbours who were white English, um, white Irish and white Scottish. And, um, and also a, a family, um, a mixed couple family, a Jamaican and an English woman. They kind of took me into their home and they uh, adopted me as one of their own children, you know, um, not a legal adoption. They just loved me as one of their own. And they taught me um, about what was going on, encouraged me not to get a chip on my shoulder. But I grew up um, getting into lots of fights at school because of um, the abuse. Um, my parents beat me with the belt nearly every day. Um, and there was no, no communion in the home about, you know, how was your day at school? Um, I got that from my adopted family. And uh, I went into care. By the time I was 11, I'd been to court five times. Um, my behaviour was so bad, they sent me into um, children's homes and observation assessment centres and places. Um, and then um, I, when I was 13, I was groomed to join a gang to be a pimp. Um, I was also sexually abused at the age of seven and raped at the age of 12 by a relative. And um, I went through um, the system of um, being in care, um, being in an approved school, because uh, they were going to send me to a juvenile prison, but they gave me a chance at an approved school. And um, there was a lot of bullying. And um, throughout my life, I fought bullies. So um, I later tried to join the army and um, I didn't score high enough on my um, aptitude test for the army. Um, I did score high, but not high enough for the mechanic regiment that I wanted to join. And um, I tried twice and when I couldn't get in and wasn't advised properly at the careers advice centre, I um, ended up getting involved in crime and gangs. Okay, let, let, let me. I'll come, back, I'll come back to you in a moment, Lennox, on that. But, but, Bally, you, you you didn't know Lennox at this point, did you? So, wh what no. was happening in what was happening in your life at this time? <laughs> well, that's funny. Um, I had um, God had done an amazing work in my life in the early nineties. I, at the age of twenty one, actually, I had really I encountered God. Um, so I would think it was about. Just before that, I was um, I had run away from home, um, was going to have a, a false arranged marriage. Uh, I was too scared to say no because uh, my dad was a very violent man. And uh, come 16, 17, I had run away and um, had ended up in a church house with a, a lovely lady who looked after girls. And uh, I was there and uh, slowly began and to understand Christianity, but couldn't quite work it out. I had mental health problems when I was a child. So um, obviously I hadn't dealt with any of the trauma um, of struggling throughout my childhood, my teenage years. Um, and I too had been in trouble by the age of 11. And But, you know, one of the big things is that when people inflict violence upon you, and when people inflict rage upon you, you either, this is what we teach kids, you know, you either take it out on others, or you take it out on yourself, or you take it out on both. 
well, I did both. And just like then, it's I started to bully. Um, sadly, I bullied, um, you know, quite severely in schools and was bullied because I didn't really you know it wasn't the right world to live in. You know, that sort of violence wasn't okay. Um, I also ended up self-harming and uh, was five stone at the age of 17. And uh, I ended up in the psychiatric system. But it was at the age of 21, and I think probably I was in the psychiatric system at the time that Lennox was going through what he was going through when he got to the stage where he'd been disappointed and not got into the army and chosen to go down the road of gangs. There's, there's um, uh, four years difference in our age, three, three and a half, four years difference in our age. So, yeah, I was in the wilderness. I was lost. Um, in mental health, really trying to work out who God was, couldn't understand what everybody else around me had these amazing conversations and miracles and stuff going on for them. And it just made me even more angry to be honest, because I couldn't work out how to okay. make that connection with someone, you know. <laughs> so, 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 Bunny, how old were you when you met Lennox? I met Lennox at the age of 39. Wow, so, okay. So yeah, a lot had happened so in his life then in between. So let's come back to you, Lennox. And uh, we, we left that. it really where you were just talking about the army had rejected you and uh, you therefore began to get involved in a life of crime. Tell us a bit more. Um, I, um, you know, from a young age, fought bullies and... Um, the abuse, the domestic violence abuse that happened to me when I was young, I took it to the streets. So eventually I, I became good at fighting and um, got quite a name for myself. And then um, people started carrying knives. And um, so I started carrying a knife and, um, you know, defended myself and uh, with, with a knife. I was headhunted by a drug dealing gang at first and um, they wanted me to join their gang. I didn't have to have an initiation or anything and um, because they, their guys were um, having problems and they, they thought that I would be a good asset. So um, I became an enforcer for them. Um, people, other drug dealers would um, get drugs from my and, and they would get it on credit and if they didn't pay back you know what they owed for kilos or um, ounces then um, they would send me to get it back and um, I would uh, be very fierce with them and violent and they would pay they also sent me to London to Brixton um, in gang ridden areas to score drugs and um, I was also introduced um, to a big massive drug dealing gang in Paddington station that um, many workers in the station they um, were a part of this drug dealing gang there were baggage handlers there were people that um, you know uh, were guards um, they were involved. There were people in management that were involved. Um, it was a big, massive eye-opener. And whilst um, I was with this gang, um, I used to frequent um, a pub named a Labour Exchange by criminals um, because you could get a job in there um, to do burglary, to do armed robberies, to do thefts. Um, there were lots of criminals in this pub and they would um, all be discussing about um, crimes and things. So you could um, get a job. And I met a guy who was part of an organised crime gang in London and um, he'd heard about me and he took me to London and introduced me to an organised crime gang, which was a massive eye-opener. The gang involved um, East End gangsters, it involved um, corrupt police, corrupt politician, um, corrupt bankers, corrupt um, business people. My mentor owned a jeweler shop and, um, you know, they were very well-to-do people. We met in a very posh um, 
kind of um, pub in um, Marleybone every week. And um, there were solicitors as well. Uh, it was huge. And I committed a string of armed robberies. Um, okay, and I saw, I think, a figure of, of 14 armed robberies in, in all. 22. 22, was it? Even worse than I, I imagined it was. <laughs> Ellie, you were going to ask something. 22 armed robberies. I was. So, <laughs> Lennox, it, it does attract a certain lifestyle. As you mentioned, you met in a really posh bar in um, Marylebone. And at that time, you must have felt quite superior as well and possibly not as lost as you did feel you know and that's what attracts a lot of younger people to organized crime is the fact that they're groomed into it as you mentioned how did you feel at this time emotionally and physically I have to suppress the abuses you know you have well, for me I had um like a filing cabinet where I kept abuse. Um, I felt good being um, involved in this gang, um, you, you know, and um, I wore suits every day. Um, I dressed nice, a uh, suit and tie. Um, and um, when I wanted to commit certain crimes, I wore hoodies and tracksuits and whatever was needed for disguise. But um, I felt really good. Um, the, the gangs, they made me feel needed. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I belonged. I had um, some identity with them, so, you, you, you know. But um, the, the pain and torment of um, the different abuses, the sexual, physical, and um, mental abuse, I felt I used to have to suppress it, you know. Um, mm -hmm because uh, it, every now and again it used to rear its head um you, you know but um this new lifestyle it, it it gave me a new meaning um and i had a, a different family mm -hmm. lennox it's it's fascinating listening to you and, and hearing the story because for the vast majority of us it's it's a lifestyle that we we can't even begin to imagine so it's helpful to do that but but here you are now you're a mentor you're going into schools and youth clubs and gangs and you're talking to them about how they need to change their life how did it happen for you how was your life changed from where you were in the midst of drugs and gangs and um, armed robberies and prison and and all the things that you're describing? Well, um, things started to go wrong. Um, you meet, you know, people in the gang that you fall out with, um, you know, so um, uh, things started to go wrong. I smoked a lot of drugs and um, have been a drug dealer myself before. And um, I started to make mistakes. I became a bit of a liability because of the mood swings that you get when you take lots of drugs. And there was a domino effect of um, things that went wrong. And um, I had to murder and um, it didn't go to plan. I, I had to also commit um, an armed robbery. Um, yeah, this is where one of the um, catalysts in what went wrong was I was given an armed robbery to do. Um, well, ac actually, I was given a, a robbery to do. And um, I took a friend with me because I couldn't um, get through uh, uh, My friend was much slimmer than me. Mm -hmm. And um, I was um, shown, uh, I was taken inside this um, travel agent's and um, by the manageress, and she showed me where they kept the case and where they kept the combination and everything like that. And what happened was um, uh, I was to go back um, with my friend later. He was going through a window that was left open and um, opened the safe. And there was something in the safe that um, the organized crime gang wanted. Um, I didn't know what it was, but we needed to clear the contents of the safe. My friend was open. It was on a Saturday, football was on, and the police were busy at the football. 
and um, he couldn't get the safe open. And so, um, to cut a long story short, uh, I had to go back the following um, week and do an armed robbery with another friend to get the contents of the safe, but there's a different. And the organized crime gang, they, um, uh, they they were angry and upset. They they kind of started to cut me off. So a lot of things started to go wrong. And I um, ended up over a period of time losing everything, even some family and friends. And um, I ended up homeless and uh, I went from one end of the country to the other until I ended up back on the streets of London. Thing. And it was winter time and my body was shutting down. Mm. Um, I had tried some um, attempts at suicide past and failed. And um, I thought, I don't, don't want to die on the street of London. And I just had this memory of me, of one of the last times I was in court, and the judge said to me, Mr. Rogers, if you get um, convicted of another knife crime offence, you'll go to prison for the rest of your life. And I thought I'd rather than die on the streets of London, you know. Um, and so it took me a week. I had um, a sharp implement on me um, for protect, and I thought I need to find someone I could pick a fight with and stab and um, go to prison. Um, and uh, it took a week to find someone. Um, I was sleeping, standing up on the streets and falling over, falling on my face. It was really hard um, trying to live homeless and learn the ropes of how to survive that life. And um, I didn't want to stab someone in front of children, in front of their families. And so what I did was um, I found this guy who wanted um, asked him for some spend and attacked him. And, um, you know, I started to run. Um, I, I shouldn't because I wanted to watch, but I instinct, I, I ran. And um, whilst I was running, I realized the guy that I stabbed, um, he, he, he was running in the same direction and he looked and screamed and ran away. But I ran around this corner in Oxford Street, and I saw an alley, and I thought I'll run down there. But when I got to the alley, it was so dark, the thickness of the darkness, um, you could almost feel it, and I couldn't see my own hand. I had to shuffle my way through the alley. Um, it turned a corner, and I, because um, I, I just couldn't see, and just had to feel the walls. And um, I bumped into industrial bins, and um, I pushed them apart and sat there. Um, crying, um, and then I um, said a prayer, you know, please God, you know, heal this guy. I, um, I didn't mean to have to use him to um, go to prison, you know, I just wanted him to be okay. Um, well, that was, your, and, that was um, your encounter with God, wasn't it? And fr from that, your life changed. Yeah. Uh, what happened next freaked me out. Um, it it was like the twilight zone. I heard a voice. I, could, I couldn't see anyone. I heard a voice saying, take my hand. And then this great big white arm appeared in front of the wall opposite me. And it was a really strong arm. You could only see up to the elbow. And you could see that it was a right hand by the way the, the thumb was. And, and um, the voice kept saying to me, take my hand. And I kept looking. I couldn't see anyone, couldn't hear anyone. And I thought, oh, I'm taking that hand. And um, eventually, because he kept asking, saying, take my hand. And I thought, I know this voice. It sounds a bit like God. And I thought to myself, um, I've tried you, but you don't work because I've, I've tried to be a Christian many times because my parents were Christians. They took me to church, forced me to church. I used to hide from the church van and that, you know, mm -hmm. and um, 
I um I said I tried you and you don't work. That's what I said in my and this voice started answering my thoughts. And you know, the Bible says that God knows the thoughts of man and but I didn't know stuff like that then. Yeah. Um, I uh, thought no, it was very I'm, scary. I, I, I'm gonna come back to you in a moment, but I wanna hear your wife's story, but also any emails in? We do indeed. We have Rob from London and he says does Lennox have any children? And if so, how does he explain racism to them? OK. A anything else? Or? We also have another one, which is, what approach does the guest use to mentor angry young people? Does he think the breakdown of the family is the main cause of kids running riot? OK. L let's, let's take the first one. I don't know if you heard from uh, Lennox and, and Bali. Maybe I could ask you, um, Bali, d do you have any children? And, and if so, how do you explain uh the whole issue of racism to them? I don't have children myself. Um, we have a, a, I have a stepdaughter and a stepson, um, but we work with so many kids around these issues. And um, often, the young people that I work, work with intensely in school, you know, stopping them from kids. They have this. It, I call it a generational thing that young people tend to sort of repeat a lot. Of that they've heard mm -hmm. around um, racism and about previous experiences of their forefathers or fathers or parents, um, but also they have their own experiences. But the whole thing is very compounded and, and I try to impact, well, I try to break that down with the young person um, based on their own experiences and, and really look at how to let go of this stuff before it becomes an issue and starts to displace on other things. I think, I think perceptions really come down to what that young person thinks about themselves and what their identity is. It is dependent on what is going to happen for that young person in their future. And if we can input into them in a way that they can see they don't, they're not defined by anything um, around them, but by what they believe about themselves, what they think about themselves, it's a it's a very different ball game, and they don't have that support from their parents because often they've already started to detach from them um, and start to go out and do that stage where um, quite rightly Lennox was saying about identity and trying to find a place to belong. So they're already become very very angry at it and starting to get angry. So you have to really sort of get alongside them to help them to see that they they are so much more than that. You know. Yeah. Well, it, well, it's great. It's great, but you're yeah. you're doing that, and both of you are doing that. Let, let yeah. me just come back to you, Lennox, because we we left you where you saw this uh, arm on the wall. You said it was a white arm. I was intrigued. Did you, as a as someone who came from a bl black background, did, did you find that very strange? Did it did you find it offensive? <laughs> How did you react? <laughs> if it was a black arm, I wouldn't have seen it. <laughs> it had to be white, you know, and it wasn't. There wasn't a glow from the arm that kind of lit up the the alley. It just was this arm that was just there. Mm -hmm. It was as if someone was lying on their stomach and reaching down into a hole yeah. and saying, take my hand. So how has your um, life so changed I, I, from that moment? It, it, you, your life, presumably, you began to move in a different direction. Tell us just a little bit briefly. Our time's just flying by, but tell us a little bit yeah. about how your life changed. After that agents in the alley, I went to the nearest police station and handed myself in. Um, and the guy at the desk was shocked that I knew the terminologies for a knife crime. I said, I've just committed a section 18. And um, they got me two big six foot something CID officers to interview me. And they interviewed me for some hours wanting to know my story. Then one of them ran out of the interview room um, um, to get more tissue um, because they were crying at the story and they decided to help me. I ended up in prison um, and um, I had a good solicitor, but I didn't want help. I wanted to be in prison. I was probably the only person who, who, who wanted to be there. And... I um, had lots of experiences in prison. I had to, I started reading the Bible um, and I met, I, I met a, 
guy called Brian Greenaway, who um, was the leader of the Hells Angel chapter. So he was an ex-gang member, and he used to come and visit me every day and meet me and help me in the prison. And, um, you know, uh, so my life changed. I um, started just um, being different. Um, it was hard to be a Christian in prison um, because people called you um, a Bible basher and happy clapper, or you're just a ticket to get out, trying to make out your good. Um, but I didn't let that stop me at all. Um, and I had lots of experiences um, uh, yeah, in, in the book where um, uh, someone tried to attack me and when I was a cleaner as well, um, someone spat on my floor and I was going to beat them up and the voice that I heard in the alley stopped me again and said, what do you think you're doing and who do you think you are? Tell that guy you're sorry. And um, See, one of the things that I was told in the alley mm -hmm. was to choose to do what's right and trust me for the rest. And it was one of the hardest things to do is to make right choices. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but that's that's what I did. And I came out of prison. I managed to get uh, a chance of a new start in a new area with a Christian family, a young Christian family in Southeast London. Mm -hmm. And um, whilst I was there, um, I was asked by some local youth workers to come and talk to a 40 strong gang about what prison's like. They sat and listened to me for two hours. Mm. Yeah, so. Well, we, um, we, we could know. sit and listen to you for two hours, but unfortunately on TV, we, we can't quite do that. <laughs> the, the, the other email that came in there was really saying, yeah. I, I guess, what we'd like to, to know, but unfortunately we haven't got much time left. How, how do you reach, you've got, you've got your own charity now, you're seeking to reach out to young people who uh, have got yeah. their lives into a mess like you had your life into a, a, a mess, Lennox. W what do you say to them? How, how do you help them? Maybe, maybe I start with you, Bally, and just t tell us a little bit about how you help and minister to people today. Yeah, I guess um, it carries on from what I was saying about, you know, identity. You're not defined by you know what's happened to you the thing that i had to do is find myself in christ at the end of the day you know my identity is not based on my color my identity is not based on what i do and if other people choose to you know uh, do what they do that's something that i have to go back to god with every time and i have to learn to let go and forgive um but i know it's not easy and i know things are really difficult and the other thing we do we do you know promote that people do speak up for injustice and I would speak up for injustice and we've seen a lot of that and it's not something that we would keep quiet about. It's a time to speak out for many of us who have kept quiet and probably been silenced by the enemy. It's time to speak out, definitely. I say to kids, it's not about how you start, it's about how you finish. Mm -hmm. And I tell them that they will be knocked down in life, but it's about how they choose to get up. And I, I try to encourage them like that, you know, and show them that there's different roads, two roads. And, you know, I show them what will happen, what can happen down both roads. They can have a life where they can be successful if they want. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take a lot of effort. Mm. Or they can go down the road I went. And, you know, if you want to join a gang, I tell them the first thing you've got to do is find where you want to be buried because... Um, that kind of lifestyle leads to death, prison, and, um, you know, it's not the kind of, it hasn't got, um, you know, a pension plan or anything like that. So um, I, I encourage young people that way, but using my own lived experiences, yeah. you know, and, and a, my, an my son... It's an amazing story what, that you're sharing with us. I, I've been asking all the questions. Ellie, have you got anything you'd like to ask? Yes, definitely. Well, thank you, firstly, for sharing your testimony with us tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I guess we don't know who's watching tonight, but what would you say um, to your 16-year-old self, looking back, knowing everything that you do now, what would you say to your 16-year-old self? Wow. <laughs> well, I, I always... Through the work I do... I look at these children and I think it's an opportunity for me to go back to my younger self and encourage them. And so 
my 16-year-old self, I would have encouraged to take a different route, to carry on, to not to um, worry about um, the, the racism, because I would have told my younger self that racism is in the, it's in the hearts and minds and attitudes and behaviours of people. And it's not everybody in this country who is racist. And we've come a long way. And I would try to encourage my 16-year-old self, you know, to, to dream and to dream big because you can achieve your goals. You can be anything you want to be in life and have anything you want to have in life. You've just got to make the right choices and go about it the right way. So I, I would encourage myself, um, you, you, you know, to... Um, work hard and dream big and things will go wrong and you get up and you brush yourself down and you start again and accept whatever help you can because there are and try to have positive people around you who will encourage you in the right way mm. yeah. it's, a, it's a remarkable <laughs> work that you're doing we, we've got your your website on the screen there www.refocusproject.org.uk that's the way that people can reach you is it if they'd like to Yes, yes, absolutely. We've got a Facebook page as well, a Breaker Facebook page and the Refocus Project Facebook page. If you want to inbox us, you're welcome to as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, just remind us, we showed that book which you've got at the beginning of the programme. Tell us again. Breaking Better. Yep. Yep. By yep. Lennox Better. Rogers. <laughs> By Lennox Rogers, breakingbetter.co.uk. That's it, yeah. breaking better. Well, it's a remarkable yeah. story, and I just want to say thank you so much for, for sharing it with us tonight. Um, if I say to you, Bila, a, a last word before we let you go, what would that be? Um, I'd, ask, I'd just say that there's so much that we probably didn't answer, and I, I apologise to the person who emailed. Um, I, it, it's a bit of a... You'd have to read the book to understand why... It was a bit difficult to answer that question, um, um, but um, yeah, there's so much more that we could say, but yeah. God is real. Um, he proved himself real to me, and if you want to find out if God is real, he loves a challenge. So ask him into your situation, into your life, and he'll prove that he's real yeah. to you. Yeah. Amen. The most important thing is connecting, connecting with him and having a relationship with him. Bless you. Happy Christ. For. Thank you so much indeed. Lovely to talk to you, Lennox, and lovely to talk to you, Bally. Thank you so Thanks much for having for, us on. Thank, thank you for you. having me on Revelation TV tonight. God bless. Bye bye. Bye. Well, we could have sat and listened to them for another hour. We could I think. have, but it's so incredible, isn't it, hearing some people's testimonies and really sharing that with our viewers as well, because it, you just don't know who's watching out there. No, I mean, I, mean I, I thought we'd have moved on to emails. I thought we'd have begun to talk about racism. I thought we might have yeah. begun to talk about the, the Black Lives Matter movement and, and so on. But none of those, I think people have been gripped by the emails, that, think... by the story they've been sharing. Yes, I think they have. But that's the thing, isn't it? When people are listening to a testimony, it's more more about listening to what they're saying and what they've been through certainly but you know we did have one earlier as well that said hi guys enjoying the show tonight and looking forward to the next hour and hello Ellie first time hearing you how lovely to have you in tonight agree about getting younger adults into faith I think there is a niche there to be filled we'll check out reflections this Saturday and that's from Laura and that's exactly what Lennox was saying as well about getting younger people onto the right path in life yeah yeah and, and when you have a life like he's had it takes a dramatic encounter with the Lord in order to change their life. Absolutely. Amen. If you really don't know the Lord in the same way that Lennox and Bally have just talked about that, we'd love to send you a booklet. We have a little booklet here at Revelation. It's called Life is Important, and uh, we'd love to send it to you. It, it's just a, a booklet with pictures and with some writing and with the stories of some of our presenters and the way that they've had encounters with the Lord as well. If you'd like a copy of it, then please just contact our office, info at revelationtv.com, or ring the number that's on the screen there in office hours and we'll send it to you. Nobody will follow you up, nobody will ring you up and say, have you read it? But it might just help you to get to that point where you realize that the Lord is real and your life is changed. Well, Ellie, thank you so much for being thank with you, me Gordon. for your first live program on Revelation TV. And thank you so much too. It's been a pleasure to have your company. God bless you. Bye-bye.
佢